So what is Creole? Uh, and, and what I'd like to do is to look at, say, what happens in the history of, of learning French by, by adults and by children. We saw examples of that before. But what we find there, so, and this is actually a very you know, um, robust fact, which is that when, when you have um, people learning French, often, so in the case of, say, object pronouns, they do produce structures of that sort, right? And, and this have to be in a this has to be in a Creole environment. It happens in Marseille. It happens in, in all kinds of varieties where you have second language learning. So, so the idea is that often, as you learn a language, you might see a particular order, like subject, verb, ob object. If that order is the dominant order, often you take that order and, you, and then you apply it to all the elements that, that might fit it. Right? You overgeneralize. Children do that all the time. When children say things like, um, oh, uh, I have one foot, and, and you have two, two foots, right? Saying foot and foot instead of saying foot and feet. It's a mystic that you know, almost every children, uh, every child will get to do in, in, the, in, the, in the path of learning French, uh, learning English. Because what, what, what do they do? They're, they're real scientists, right? They have an hypothesis about, say, plural. OK, S marks the plural. So why should you bother to say feet if you have a plural, a well-behaved plural like S? If you say, I don't know, if you say table, tables, if you say pen, pens, why would you say foot, feet? You, you, it's a fine hypothesis, right? And children do that, right? So in the same here, if you know that y your language has verb object order, you say, you know, frappe le ballon, hit the ball, why would you say, when you have a pronoun, why would you put it before the, the verb? It seems to be a natural hypothesis if you're a learner to assume that a pronoun, like a full noun, will come after the verb. And that's what you see, you know. Um, and this is, uh, so, so the, the, the contrast is between standard French, where you get the pronoun before the verb, and this is uh, L2A French. This is a learner's French, an adult learner's French, where you get the pronoun after the verb, right? So now to make a long story short, uh, go ahead, Nick. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's just off topic, but I, like, why, like, if it's like the most natural thing to assume that it, uh, the object follows the verb, like, how is how how is it ever, how did French ever develop this weird thing? That, 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 that's 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 a good question. That, that's exactly you know, it. means that as you learn a language, there are other there are other factors in that learning, right? So, although the learner might have a natural tendency to do that, but since in the case of French, there are norms, there are books, there are, there's TV, so eventually the learner will. Will move towards a, a different set of patterns, you know. But then languages do change, and in, in language change, often there is there is a path towards more general. Uh, think of, for example, you know, so Steven Pinker, a very good linguist, was at MIT you know, at, at Harvard. He has a whole book on how the patterns of regular verbs change in English, right? Things like um, uh, go, went, or shine, shown. Uh, so many of these, over time, become regular. So you go from shine shown to shine shined. Well, it, it, that hasn't happened yet, right? But what you should is that over time, there is a movement of verbs going from being irregular to being regular. And one could explain that because of the fact that there's a tendency to make all these verbs fit the same, the same pattern, the regular pattern, right? But at the same time, there's also prescriptive norms. You know, there's a prestige language. There's a language called Tony Kroc, who actually argued that very often changes occur in a different direction. Because why? Because people use language to show that they are fancy, they are sophisticated. So they will use the more the, the irregular pattern to show off. It's like the who whom case, right? So how many of you hear people saying whom in all the wrong places? Because, <laughs> right? because, because whom, when you say whom, or when you say John and I, it might sound fancier than John and me. But what you find is that often people will, will say John and I or Mary and I in the wrong place. They will say, you know, um, I just had a good talk with Mary and, you know, no, uh, my dad went, went to see Mary and I. So, but Mary and I in that particular context is not, is not correct. It should be Mary and me because it's, it's the object, right? So why would you say Mary and I in object position? But because Mary and I sound fancier, people would tend to use it. Or the whom thing. We saw earlier that there, there are cases where people say whom which grammatically is not correct, but because it sounds fancy. So whom should I say is calling? You know, I hear that all the time. People say, you know, 
whom, whom called you? Whom called you? It should be who called you, right? Because, it's a, but because according to the grammar of the language, in that, in that particular environment, it's, it's a subject. So you, you don't expect to get whom. Because whom is, whom is for who, technically, you know, in terms of grammar, like him is for he, or like her is for she. Right? This is basically the function of the, of the M on whom. It makes it a, an accusative um, form. But yet people now use whom even when it's a subject. Why? Because it sounds fancy. It sounds, in fact, there's a linguist that call it a, a, a virus, a grammar virus. You get infected because you want to sound fancy. You see? So, so that, that's, in fact, talking about identity, that's one place where identity might play a role in language change because by using those forms, you want to project yourself as being as being superior, as being, you know, sophisticated, you know, and then you would use, it's like in, in Creole, in Asian Creole, people use often the rounded vowels from French to show that they know French, but they use the rounded vowels like U mm. instead of E, where it doesn't belong, and they produce all kinds of weird sentences where you get all these U's where even in French you have E, because they perceive that the U is the French, is the marker of, of French, not Creole, and therefore they want to use it all over the place. You see, and it's called hypercorrection. You hypercorrecting yourself, but uh, as you hypercorrect, you be, you sound stupid, really. You know, really. Be, you know, and then and there are all these jokes about it actually, because people are aware that people who use all these U's is because they don't really know where to use the U. So it's it's a, it's a pressure of society on on speaking in a particular way that actually creates all kinds of weird patterns that eventually can become part of the language. So that's so that that's one dri driving force. In, in language change is this desire to sound better than you are. It's like, you know, people who vote for Trump, they might vote for Trump, not because they believe in Trump, but because it might mean something for their identity. You know, it's like, so language has this power of also establishing status. So when you struggle with your identity, can be prone to grammar virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's one way to put it, actually, yeah. The next part that I was going to talk about had to do with, um, so why, why does um, language learning by adults have this effect on, say, verb order, on conjugation? And, and the, the point can be made very, very, very quickly, which is that um, you know, this is something which is universal, that we know in many contexts of um, language learning that, that adults do have this effect. So that when they learn, say, if you're going to learn, say, Italian or or any other languages that have lots of markers on the verb for conjugation, often in the first stages of learning, you, you, you don't have these. You, you drop these and it's a, because you're trying to speak the language. And these are to be memorized. And, and at, at first, you will not memorize them properly. So it seems that it's a general phenomenon. And the point here is that, um, so the key, maybe the key paragraph here is this one, that maybe the way to understand language change, and which, I, in my view, um, include cl formation, is, is to consider the effect of both language learning by adults and by children. And if that's the case, then that's, that's what is going to drive all kinds of language change, not just what, what you see in the case of um, creole formation. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so this is um, another part of the conclusion, just to recapitulate that basically, so to those of you who are asking, so what's my theory of, of creole formation? I don't need one. You see, I don't need one because cross formation is just language change. So whatever linguists understand about the way languages change, to me it applies to cross formation. So I have one paper that came out earlier this year with Enoch Abu, my, um, my colleague from the Bene, from West Africa. And, and the paper is called A Nil Theory of Realization, right? It's nil in the sense that it's, it should be the default theory that Creoles are like other languages. So therefore, you don't need to have a, a special theory for them. So it should be the new hypothesis that Creoles don't need a theory. <laughs> Whatever theory applies to French or English should apply to Creole. 